Welcome back to our second session. As you settle into the seat, um, let me just offer a little sibilance. No, just joking. Um, if you lost um, a card in the women's toilet room that helps facilitate your movement on Metro, <laughs> we have it. Um, and I guess allegedly it is keyed to you. Um, so we do have that, but it doesn't have a name on it at this moment. Um, <clears throat> but we're eager to connect. Um, <clears throat> I am Kelly Quinn and I'm moderating the sessions for today. If you are just joining us, welcome. If you're just joining us in the auditorium, welcome. If you're joining us on Twitter, welcome. Um, our hashtag is uh, hashtag AAHDS, American Art History and Digital Scholarship. I understand that we have quite a, a stream there. So great, thank you, Matthew Lincoln, for affirming that. I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I need a lot of affirmation. So thank you for nodding your head. Um, and thank you for laughing. Um, so, the way that we'll proceed is I will introduce our speakers who will present their work after each, um, each, after the presentations are done, we will then open it up for a conversation from the audience. We have two microphones set up at either side of the auditorium, so if you would like to make your way to one of those, we are asking that people speak directly into the microphone so that we can all hear your words and also that we can capture it um, <clears throat> on our live stream. We are also interested in brokering collaborations today and these collaborations may be between people who are interested generally in subject areas, methods or tools um, or who have technical expertise. So if you have been in the lobby, perhaps you have seen uh, big blocks of paper with small post-it notes. Feel free to enter one or more, um, uh, one of the categories. You can, you're welcome to mark your name on it. And I'll collect those and we will circulate. You're opting in to, uh, to sharing your contact information with others. Perhaps there will be people who know someone who know someone who can help you scrape or clean um, your data, um, but there might also be people you can think with. We are also really eager to think about how to continue the conversation and what the archives role can be in brokering that, either by providing you with our data and um, resources or by introducing you to other people and institutions around the country and indeed the world. Um, <clears throat> It is because we have networks that we can do the kind of work that we do. And it is that question of networks and how artists have been supported by and at the center or periphery of or the pivoting positions in networks that we'll consider in this next set of presentations. Um, and in a way, it again models some of the kind of collaborative activity that we've already seen uh, demonstrated in the first session. In that way, um, our first speakers, Michelle Moriavec and Melissa Rogers, um, first met at a that camp. And I should say, I am assuming that people know what that camp is, but that camp exactly is um, technology, humanities, the humanities and technology camps, and they are attached to different kinds of organizations and institutions. And for art historians, know that there is an open call now and an application for that camp College Art Association 2014 to be held in Chicago in February. But in fact, Melissa and Michelle met at that camp feminism um, at Barnard. And then as they began thinking out loud, uh, or at least as Michelle began thinking out loud on Twitter about the work of Carolee Schneemann, um, you struck up a conversation, and I believe our colleague Mary Savig, as part of our social media outreach, um, encouraged 
maybe even urged, uh, pleaded with you to apply to join our conversation. And we're delighted to have you um, help us think about what do networks look like for artists and how might we understand them and what when we try and track relationships, what more can we learn? In that way, we will also benefit from the work of Tisha Holtz, who will ask us to think about what is the network for the post-war avant-garde art market um, <clears throat> based firmly in archival research, but then also using a set of digital tools. And I think that'll be a theme that we continue to hear throughout the day. How do historians, art historians, humanists generally turn to digital tools to try and understand networks and context? We also are interested in thinking about how do curators present information and how do we understand maybe familiar figures like Andy Warhol in a larger web of ideas. And so we'll hear from Jessica Gogan and Tressa Varner, who at different points in their career have been, uh, careers have been associated with the Andy Warhol Museum, but who will talk to us today about the Warhol time web. So again, we'll hear from each of our uh, sets of presenters. We'll open it up for conversation and, um, and discussion. So without further ado, I give to you Michelle Morjevec and Melissa Rogers. Well, as you've no doubt realized just from the presentations this morning, no digital project takes place all by yourself. Um, this project would have been impossible without Christine Stiles, who did the long work of editing Schneemann's correspondence. But also, I need to thank Laura Sell and Diane Grosset from Duke University Press, who helped me to secure an electronic version of the text that I could work with. Uh, E.J. Guerra helped with processing the data, but most of all, my indefatigable research assistant, who did an incredible amount of hand labor on the project. My research questions about Schneemann are simple. What can a network analysis of her correspondence reveal about her overlapping circles? And what can a corpus linguistics approach to her correspondence reveal about her as a female artist in a largely male milieu? Schneemann made carbon copies of all of her correspondence. The Getty uh, owns them, and the correspondence course volume published by Duke University Press in 2010 represents only about one-third of the total correspondence. It is also a highly edited selection designed by Stiles to place uh, Schneemann within a particular story of art. And as such, I'm hesitant to draw very large conclusions from such a, a limited set. But the opportunity to work with the correspondence digitally, which for those of you who have worked in the digital humanities, you know correspondence means getting permission of letter writer, letter author. Um, which had been secured for me already by the publisher was too tempting to pass up. The first visualization I'm showing you uh, reveals how difficult it is to simplify Schneemann. She's a complicated artist. I would point you to the excellent snack archive, um, which at the top places her within subject headings. The bottom works metadata from some major art historical archives to place her within a larger web of people. This is a visualization of the letters to and from Schneemann in the volume. I know that there are some missing, whether you hand clean or scrape, you get messy data, and indeed, that is turning out to be one of the key questions of the day. Do you work with your messy data or not? I worked with messy data. Here it is, represented. <laughs> You can see that she has about two-thirds of the correspondence in this volume, as opposed to one-third being from letter recipients, and that they um, cluster pretty heavily towards um, a certain core group, her tribe or her inner circle, and that that group tilts pretty heavily male, which you can see in this slide. Artists, as would be expected, comprise the majority of her correspondence, and they split fairly evenly by gender, but other um, groups did not split very evenly at all. As Liza Kerwin hinted in her opening remarks, the um, idea of being able to map people in terms of spatial locations is very um, interesting. This slide shows the named entity recognition processed by um, Stanford software. I hand cleaned the results, so again, I did not go through and correct for tags that were missed, but you can see she's quite diverse geographically in terms of who she corresponded with. In terms of visualizing her circles, I looked at things by volume as well as by number of correspondence. Three key friendships are represented in the book, perhaps overrepresented. I'm not sure. There's 19 boxes at the Getty. I only looked at probably a tenth when I was there. Um, 
Stan Brackage, the poet Clayton Eshleman, and the musician James Tinney, who was also her first husband, are the bottom three on this radar graph, and you can see that tilts the correspondence hugely towards them. I was also curious, though, what if I looked at the content of the letters, could I find more women? Again, this used um, named entity recognition that I didn't clean for, but the pink circles are women, and you can see even in the content of the letters, she's referring more to male artists, more to male philosophers more to male figures. Five of the female figures are actually mythological goddesses. If I had put her cats in, <laughs> Shneman, of course, is very famous for her relationships with her cats, and she loved her cats and wrote to people about them a lot. I almost did a day to visit the cats, but I didn't have enough space. So. Okay. Working through the letters through corpus linguistics is the other thing that I did. Um, corpus linguistics looks at patterns between words using math. That's the simplest way I know how to describe it. It took me like two years to learn all about corpus linguistics, so that's a really short um, explanation. You do have to become a statistician. That must be the secret second message of today. Patterns require statistics, which means if you didn't take it in college, go learn it now. I did um, a couple of kinds of statistical analyses on the um, corpus of her letters. We're going to look only at her correspondence today. So two words you have to know. Collocates, words that appear together at a frequency greater than the random chance in a body of text. And keywords, unusually frequent words in a corpus when measured against a reference. I was very lucky here. The Schneemann correspondence provides me with a reference corpus. I have the letters written to her and I can use her letters as my two corpora. Okay. So this is a data visualization that shows you the likelihood of two words going together. One of the most unusual things about Schneemann, and I had to check with other corpus linguistics, is that the word the appears more frequently in her texts. Now, that's weird. Most people use the word the a lot. Um, the y-axis here shows you the likelihood that words are associated by chance. The uh, x-axis shows you the observed frequency differences, chance, not chance. And you can see in the upper right corner, the pink dots are her correspondences. I'm going to be looking at the collocate the past today, because to me, as a historian, that was absolutely fascinating, but also because of Schneemann's historical work, such as her 1975 book, Cezanne, She Was a Great Painter, or the 1962 uh, to 1992, collecting uh, her massive research into prehistory, unexpectedly research. Okay, so how does the past appear in Schneemann's correspondence? I found about five separate ways that I saw her working through the past. One of the first ways she uses the past is to frame her relationship to art history. Schneemann still describes herself as a painter, and for her, Cezanne is really the touchstone of where she jumped off the canvas and out into the three-dimensional. So I was delighted that one of the first uses of the past is in a letter to Stan Brackage in which she compares herself to Cezanne and talks about what she can take from Cezanne and what she can't. And you can see, I put the letter recipients, the kind of grayish is, is women. You can see they're relatively dispersed between men and women, and they're relatively equal across time. They don't seem to cluster too interestingly. A second usage of the past is a torment from the past. These appear almost exclusively in letters to men, and they are about her relationships with men and her desire to find a way to be an independent artist and reconcile that with personal relationships with artists, so it's not surprising those cluster pretty heavily towards the men. The past to the present, it looks at the way she um, meditates upon her past as um, part of her artwork, and it's a consistent theme. And these are interesting, again, because at least in the volume of correspondence I have, she talks about her, depth, her work in depth more with men than she does with women. Oops, that's a rogue slide, sorry about that. One of the absolute most fascinating um, aspects of the way she used the past has to be as a framing device for revelatory insights. And they come out of this correspondence that I have got to get back into the Getty to look at. Between her and a woman named Naomi Levinson, and Stiles has edited these letters so extensively, yet there is nothing about Naomi Levinson. She would appear to be a friend from college years. The correspondence clusters from 57 to 60, and there are 14 letters from Schneemann to Levinson, so that you don't have the other half of the correspondence. But they are these very deep, early letters where you can see Schneemann really grappling 
with herself and her work. And the most fascinating way is um, in her comparison of herself to Stan Brakhage's wife, Jane. And so at the end of this very long letter in which she's used Jane almost as a foil for herself as the only non-artist in their frequent couple weekends that they spend together, she, she frames this insight as this past week and then asked Naomi Levinson to validate her insight. And then she repeats this in these letters to Levinson over and over again, referencing um, what appears to be the beginning of her interest in prehistorical goddesses, 1959, um, and my personal favorite, telling Stan Brackage in 1982 that her past is her past and he needs to stop manipulating it in his usages. <laughs> that might be my, 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 my all-time favorite usage. The fifth one is, a, is the final art historical context, and you see this emerging in the late 1970s as the avant-garde art circles that she circulated in became historicized. And she becomes increasingly upset, um, particularly at feminist critics and art historians, for their failure to place her where she thinks she should be in this larger sort of story of art. Um, so um, I found it absolutely amazing. The last usage was in 1999 in a letter to Cindy Carr in which she both thanked her for including her in a um, review, but also expressed her dismay at the quote, current Lacanian cul-de-sac denying feminine, female authenticities and expressed her perplexities at the eroticized feminine as abjection. She notes her own historical position, that she has only had two works bought by U.S. museums at this point, and her amazement at the gallery success that young women who are making body art are finding. But she ends by asserting, who the fuck are we kidding? Between Tracy Emin in the bathtub and Karen Finley as a chocolate edible Playboy feature, where do we locate a feminine, feminist politics? And indeed, the end of the correspondence, we see Schneemann as the foremother of feminist art in equal parts remonstrating with younger women for their failure to identify her as a predecessor, but also reflecting on all things past as she attempts to find her own situation. I have not really tried to answer the questions I set out to answer because, as I said, the co corpus is simply too small. I'm dying to get back into the Getty and look at things, but I would also note that I would really like to look at another significant collocate, the first because it creates a chronological bookend. Thank you. Hi, my name's Melissa Rogers. I'm just gonna pull up my presentation here, oops. Um, so I am a doctoral student um, at the University of Maryland. Um, I'm in the Department of Women's Studies. Um, and like some other folks up here, um, I don't have an, an extensive team. Um, but it was really exciting um, to work with Michelle um, and also to, you know, to be here today. So thanks so much. Um, you're, you're also welcome to tweet me. Um, so uh, as any of you who've tried to embark on a digital, digital humanities project know, um, your, <laughs> your ideas and your timeline quickly evolve with one another, um, along with these kind of like tools you have to select um, to work on this stuff. So um, my presentation's really in the idea stage, and I really do welcome all kinds of feedback um, and suggestions, because this really was an experiment in kind of like running up against constraints um, and figuring out how to kind of work through them. Um, so this idea, um, which Michelle so nicely kind of introduced to us, um, I was really interested in um, exploring the more ephemeral um, aspects of, Sh of Schneemann's work. Um, so she was a prolific male artist. Um, I'm gonna show you like one of her letters, um, which is really densely collaged. Um, and this, this, um, the male art and the letters were really kind of a daily um, or almost daily practice. Um, so I'm interested in thinking about what can those tell us about her more well-known work, um, like her performance performances, her films, um, and some of these assemblages. She did some really great um, little box constructions that she was kind of sending to people um, and, and exchanging with people. 
Um, I also wanted something interactive um, that was going to engage the letters as visual artifacts, um, visual and spatial um, and temporal artifacts. Um, so something that wasn't just going to give us the content. Um, and you know, Styles in her introduction to Correspondence Course um, describes some of the kind of orthographic inconsistencies that she had to deal with in editing these texts. So long dashes, weird capitalizations, this kind of stuff. Um, so I wanted to really grapple with some of that, the visual aspects of these letters. Um, and I also wanted to experiment with storytelling. Um, I think feminists um, and art historians are really interested in what kind of visual stories can we tell um, and what are the political implications of that? Um, how can a visual story give us a more multi-dimensional or nuanced look um, at an artist's work? Um, so I, I wanted to experiment with this set of tools um, called Neatline for Omeka. Um, so Neatline, according to the Scholars Lab website, right, is a geotemporal annotation framework. Essentially, it, it allows you to um, kind of create these interactive maps um, that also function as archives. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of this um, in a second. Um, and it, it runs on Omeka. Um, so Omeka is this free um, and open access publishing platform. Um, it allows you to kind of input digital collections and manage the metadata um, and create um, exhibits um, and build websites. Um, and this runs off of Linux. I'm also going to explain that in a second. Um, you can download it at omeka.org if you have all the requirements. Um, you can also get um, these, th there's a series of plans um, for if you don't have your own server, you can kind of host these exhibits. Um, and uh, read the fine print um, without kind of, you know, I, I did end up buying one of these plans. It was like the $50 plans, right, but they go up to, to like $100, $300, and then um, $999 for an institution. Um, so I, I don't necessarily recommend that you go out and buy this right away. Um, it was clunky. It was not necessarily what I was expecting, or it wasn't exactly useful for what I was trying to do. Um, so I kind of had to learn that the hard way. Um, but I do want to show you, I do want to pull up, and I, I encourage you to go um, explore their demos uh, on the Neatline website um, in your own time. But this is just to give you a little bit of sense of what you can do, right? Um, a lot of these collections um, involve amateur maps um, and kind of the movement of troops, um, battles, right? You're able to kind of upload this map onto a real map um, onto like, you know, Google Maps or um, GIS um, and get, um, you're, you're able to anno annotate things so you can kind of like draw lines, um, you can zoom in and out, you can follow a timeline. Um, they really emphasize that this is for um, a handcrafted looking exhibit um, in space and time. Um, so do go check those out. Um, they're really impressive and exciting. Um, but then, the, the rub. <laughs> um, th so this is kind of the infrastructure for Omeka and Neatline with LAMP. Um, so it runs on the operating system Linux, um, Apache, which is um, your server, um, MySQL, which is the database, and then PHP, which is the, um, the language. And I can't fully explain to you what this all means, um, but I know that I don't have it um, and probably <laughs> I'm not going to be able to learn it uh, s super quickly. Um, so just throwing that out there. So why use these tools um, to visualize Carol H. Neiman? Um, I think she's kind of an excellent example um, because her, uh, you know, as Michelle said, her practice is really painterly. Um, it's processual. It's iterative, right? Um, this is from iBody um, in 1963. This is one of the first examples of her using her body on a scale with her work. Um, so just to kind of zoom in on that a little bit, um, she's got these great kind of light, larger than life-size panels. She was working in a furrier studio, so there's all these great textures in her work. Um, she's got these glass assemblages. She's got motorized umbrellas. Um, really fascinating. So I think the fact that her work is so intimately tied to space and time, um, movement and the body, and also these different places where she was working, um, really make for um, an exciting, exciting possibilities for an exhibit. Um, she also, right, has this uh, extensive correspondence, and this is one example of her letters. This is a letter to Jean-Jacques um, Lebel um, in 1964. It's densely collaged. Um, oops, that's not where I wanted to go. I will go back. 
Um, it's den densely collaged. Um, she's got these scrapbooks and performance journals at the Getty um, that keep track of her thinking. Um, and I think this is a really important background um, for her performance work and in installations. Um, so getting this e-text of correspondence course is really able to go through and kind of look for her, um, her performances and see what she was talking to other artists about. Um, you know, she's really highlighting for them, oh, you, you know, you should have seen this. Oh, this is really going to um, affect my thinking in, in the next work that I'm doing. Um, and she was also sending and receiving um, mail art um, and these fluxus objects, um, which are ki kind of hard to document and archive because they're so um, unique and individual. Um, she's also a prolific scholar herself. Um, you know, she really, she's producing feminist knowledge. She's still engaged in that. Um, and there's been these series of books um, that have come out um, in collaboration with her uh, and with these other scholars like Stiles, um, you know, to be able to theorize her work. So I think Neatline could here function as a really interesting portal for this information. Um, so I'm really thinking about using Schneeman's techniques as a model, right? Um, and this is what my mentor, um, Katie King, in her book, Networked Reenactments, called a reenactment, right? So she says the reenactments bundle together both things um, and ways of grasping things, um, the making of knowledge and the demonstration of how to use it. Um, so she says this is part of scoping and scaling. This is essentially like the web action that we'd, you would use in Google Maps, right? Zooming in and out. I think Neatline can let us do that, and I think Pre Prezi lets us do that too. Um, so this is just a key moment in some of this work. Um, this is up to and including her limits. Um, I was able to find this letter where she um, describes the piece um, and also kind of describes this um, hunger that she had to work with other women artists and to talk with them. Um, so I think the letters really provide this kind of unique insight into the development of that piece. Um, also, in terms of trying to track this, um, this feminist network, um, she, you know, she was really mourning her, the loss of her friend, Anna Mendieta, from this kind of suspicious um, death, right? So she does create this memorial piece. She also describes um, exchanging photographs of the piece um, with other artists for like their poetry and their work because she was still between jobs and grants. Um, and you could see kind of her, her little dollar sign there. Um, so kind of next steps. Right now I really need a more reasonable timeline. Um, <laughs> but I'm looking like probably six months would be a minimum. Um, and the main like time intensive part of this is the copyright and permissions from the Getty. Um, there's a lot involved in this. Um, I also need some collaborators um, who can like use some of this stuff. Um, so I'm thinking about reaching out to the Scholars Lab and of course the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media. Um, I also need to think about some costs, so where am I going to host this stuff? Um, and finally, thinking about where this fits into my dissertation. Um, so I just think this is a great opportunity to kind of capture some of this ephemera. So thanks, I welcome any feedback you have.